exploring some more facets of Katicha Samapada dependent origination. And uh, today our exploration is going to take us further into the world, but to uh, understand what happens further into the world, uh, we need an even better understanding of what's happening within the organism, within the body mind, within this psychophysical totality, as Venerable Punaji puts it. Um, and again, it's, it's orienting us in our lives, in our work together, in our understanding, understanding of suffering and the end of suffering. And uh, the uh, beacon that we keep referring to is this. As for the qualities of which you may know, these qualities lead to dispassion, not to passion, to being unfettered, not to being fettered, to shedding, not to accumulating, to modesty, not to self-aggrandizement, to contentment, not to discontent, to seclusion, not to entanglement, to aroused persistence, not to laziness, to being unburdensome, not to being burdensome. You may, categor you may categorically hold, this is the Dhamma, this is the Vinaya, this is the teacher's instruction. So one of the key images for today is going to be this. Um, and I put it up here. You don't need the details in the text. I just want to, I, I just really want you to have the, um, just the sense of this image, this notion of cycles, of loops. Uh, don't worry about the order of things. Don't just get the sense this is happening all the time, intrapersonally, interpersonally, within the family, socially, culturally, okay? So again, just the sense of it is very important to what we're doing today. So let's go back. Um, for starters, I want to look at um, uh, a tr another traditional way of looking at, in fact, graphically looking at and understanding dependent origination uh, that will form uh, kind of, I think, a good starting point. And that is this uh, circle. So frequently, you know, we say the same things that we've been talking about, where we begin by looking at ignorance, because when we don't see what's going on, and the momentum of having not seen, and this moving forward of not seeing, of not knowing, avija, ignorance, not knowing, that momentum really uh, sets in motion the whole constructing process from which consciousness arises and the whole body-mind uh, uh, experience is that which consciousness is knowing, which is specified into the six sense spaces, which becomes the particular doorways for contact of the organism in the world in that sense of uh, that uh, you know, there is this physical world that has visual and auditory and tactile and, you know, so on and, and mind. And from each of those contacts arises a feeling, some sort of pleasant, unpleasant, or neither pleasant nor unpleasant sensory experience. Okay? Can be contact with the eye, the ear, the nose, the tongue, the body, the mind. But the Vedana, the feeling, is the pleasant, unpleasant, and neither aspect of it that then drives us, motivates us, 
to get the pleasant and to avoid the unpleasant, to ignore the neither pleasant nor unpleasant, which is something all of us are doing right now, each moment. And from that, there's a thirsting that then, of course, drives the gripping of experience, the freezing to get and hold and control, and that sustains the sense of the world that creates the becoming that is the self. The identity, moment by moment, is now getting uh, clear. You might say strong, I would say pushy. And from that comes the enfleshment of that experience as birth each moment. And of course, then what we birth into is built on this whole cycle, right? And what do you think you get? You get dukkha, you get suffering. So that's the straight ahead in this moment, you might say radical, phenomenal, psychological understanding of the human experience. Um, and in this, what we see, especially when we go to the notion of the multiple lives that we spoke about last, last time, where from the ignorance you have the karma forming, karma forming processes, the construction, the sankara, uh, and those karma forming processes then uh, give the impetus, the arising of a consciousness that is then reborn in, you know, in a body, nama rupa, and then you have this whole cycle of life that occurs as the sense bases take form, feeling thirst, clinging, and then you're gonna have the rebirth now becoming is now interpreted as literal rebirth by many, uh, physical, in other words, through a womb in that moment, not the womb of the Sankaras, but the womb of a mother. And birth into suffering, and then after that whole life and that whole cycle, we get, you know, the clustering of ignorance and the cycle just keeps going, right? So that circle notion, it helps clarify. Um, and I'd like to... extrapolate, go deeper with the, um, let's call it the forward impulsion aspect that that kind of cycle, cycling of processes, of dynamics creates. Because, I mean, any of us could I'll speak personally. I mean, I can look at my own life and see that the running of the mind, which is not separate from the running of the body, it's nama rupa, you know, that this body mind gets into its squirrel cage. And sometimes the squirrel cage is pleasant. And sometimes the squirrel cage is unpleasant and sometimes the squirrel cage is torturous and miserable. That's the human dilemma, is being stuck in the squirrel cage. No sense of choice, no sense that this can be clipped. It can be clipped anywhere, but I have no sense of that. Because in that moment, I'm in the cage. And it's a cage of ignorance. Right? So the, there are certain inner dynamics of this process that we're going to talk about now briefly that kind of show us the... It's almost like the, um, the fusion reaction of becoming suffering. Okay? So the first I'd like to touch is also the most subtle, which is maybe not a smart way to start, but in a way it's like everything else will be easier <laughs> because this one is so subtle. Um, and it's right here.
Okay. So if I take this right back to the canon, right back to the Buddha's words, the Buddha taught very clearly two things that seem to be in conflict. One is right here in Ticca Samapada that dependent upon consciousness arises name and form. So each moment consciousness arises, as we said before, what's being known by consciousness? Consciousness, consciousness needs an object or there's no, there's no cognizing. There's no knowing of the world because there's no world to know. So consciousness arises and knows name and form knows body mind that's all we know go out and look at a tree well you say the tree's out there there's seeing and there's consciousness arising of seeing and then there's the perception and the notion of tree that's the nama the perception the feeling and giving attention to the tree and so on that's what you know that's what the world is okay so, nama rupa um, arises dependent upon consciousness. If there's no consciousness, there's no nama rupa. That's what this says. In the absence, you know, when you go in reverse and you look at the, the liberating dynamic, when there's no consciousness, there's no name and form. It doesn't arise. And of course, what that's saying is when there's no consciousness arising dependent upon ignorance, there's no name and form arising dependent upon ignorance. Really simple. No ignorance. It's not saying in such a moment a physical tree does or doesn't exist. Don't worry about it. any of that kind of metaphysical, philosophical stuff. What matters for suffering and the end of suffering. So dependent upon consciousness, this experience of nama rupa, of name and form, arises. Okay. But the Buddha also teaches what, is the, what are the depend, dependent conditions for consciousness. And he's not just talking about the constructing process. He says consciousness arises dependent upon nama rupa, upon name and form. And here's a way of understanding it. Could there be the arising of consciousness if there's nothing to be conscious of? Could there be, let's say, thinking or seeing? If there's no body mind, uh, you might say that's the basis of that experience. It, the, the notion is so absurd that it's like hard to get because it's sort of like if you weren't here, would you be here? It's a question, something like that. Does that make sense? No nama rupa, no body mind, no consciousness. See what I'm saying? Don't, we don't want to overthink it. Just get a sense of it. So one, one um, it, there's a sutta that I'm not going to quote now, where the Buddha points this out specifically, saying that consciousness too has a, you know, has a, a, a originating cause, you might say, or conditions. And, you know, says Nama Rupa. And so they cycle around each other, he says. That one point uh, has been utterly and brilliantly elaborated by a Sri Lankan uh, contemporary. I think he's died recently. I'm not sure. When I saw him a couple of years ago when I was uh, in robes, he was pretty near to death with lung diseases from living in a cave all his life. Um, Venerable Nyanananda, and uh, he has brilliantly through his life unpacked this uh, and written about it. You can get it online. We can talk about that another time. Um, and he refers to this as a vortex. Right? Where Mind creates the world, the world creates the mind, and we're in this, basically, it's sort of like the dynamic, if I can go back to other indigenous traditions, of why this life is called a dream. It's right here. 
the mind creating the world, the world creating the mind, constantly recycling. And oh my God, it's like this. I'm with my sister or my mother. My beloved is dying. I'm ill. Society is unjust. Constantly creating the world that way. Nama Rupa comes to be formed, this whole body mind, which is to say the world of experience is now coming in through this notion, this, this view of consciousness, and it is completely real, just the way a dream is real when it's real. So even though we talk about this internal, this intrapersonal dynamic, um, in, I would say, fairly blunt psychological terms sometimes. If you want a doorway into the mystery of life, this is where you're going to go. So I'm going to give you just a second to, to look at that and just I'll get out of the picture. You can ponder that for a second. And would that it were that simple. It's actually not. Because there's loops all over the place. And I'll point out a couple of more loops that will help us maybe, if nothing else, have compassion for being born. Um, another important loop is the... Uh, I'd like to point it out, let's say, let's, let's start here. Um, what I'm gonna focus on, just briefly, is the constructing process, Sankara. And uh, it came to me as I was pondering this, uh, maybe some of you are familiar with the popularity in some circles, even the power of the word narrative, story, narrative coaching, narrative therapy, uh, this, the narrative of our society, or what is your personal narrative? What is your personal story that the way you view and see the world? So it's another way of looking at DT, a view or views uh, that gives some sense of uh, that story, but remember now, that story is real. Do you understand what I'm saying? We make the dream so the story is real. Moment by moment, this is what we're doing. One of you, I'm looking at you, you know, most of you are sitting in chairs. This is me sitting in a chair and I have this history and it's really like this. Something as simple as that. Or my family is really like this and that's kind of why I'm so screwed up, you know. Uh, or, uh, uh, you know, I grew up in this society but then I moved to a different culture and this happened and here, here's, here's how I am. That's the story of self. And of course, it doesn't take long to see that we build the story of the world as well. So right here, we have the basis for a loop that involves, it's really all of this, of all of the feeling, clinging, becoming stuff, but I'm just gonna stay with birth, with the enfleshment the sense of the reality of this experience. And I am born into this world like this, instant by instant. And each, each moment of birth, I'm reinforcing the existing constructed notions. I'm reinforcing my story, instant by instant. So every time, now I'm going to spread it out to the rest of the you know, of this dependent origination thing. 
So every time through the six sense spaces, there's contact with, let's say, let's take a really juicy one, like my mom. If your mother is still alive, that's easier. Uh, if you want to project onto someone else that's alive, that's maybe present for you. Or if your relationship with your mother was really strong and you could feel it now, that's fine too. So every time there's contact with my mom, or importantly, the thought of my mom, right? Don't forget, it's just as potent. Then there's all of this stuff, assuming the ignorance, assuming that there's not the knowing of the process and the possible cutting that we'll talk about later. All of this is set in motion. And in this instant, I am born, I am enfleshed into the bodily experience of this dream that's built Sankara Pachaya Vijnana by all prior formations, verbal formations, mental formations, bodily formations, everything that's done, especially the volitional, right? That which really registers in the body mind. And significantly in this birthing, where the form, the body, the flesh, you know, gets juicy. We can talk about the, the material juices. We can look at that cycle of, you know, that I think all of us are somewhat familiar with. When certain kinds of thoughts and moods come up, there's a flushing of the body. Oh, mom, I love you so much. Or you, I can't believe you did that to me. And up comes the anger that has you know, various uh, hormones, if we want to talk about it materialistically, that then affect the mind because they're you know, dynamically active neurally, and various neural transmitters are getting going. This is all just a material way of talking about this stuff. Just this little piece of this stuff, it doesn't capture it all. And so we have the body-mind loop, the Nama Rupa loop, just within itself. And so there's this loop, and there's a lot of power in it, tremendous power. And it emphasizes the becoming, and driving that loop, instant by instant, is contact with the world. So this is still being stimulated as long as I'm, let's say, in front of mom. And uh, the feeling, the thirst, the clinging and stuff is becoming, it, it, you're moving into the becoming identification me, I am, the tense knot of I am, and all the specifics I have of I am built on this, these Sankaras, my narrative, my story, my personal history with my mother, which goes back to the, you know, the, the forming of this fleshly body. It just can't go back any further as far as I know in this life. And so this stuff, the clinging and the thirst, is like this engine of energy, thirsting. That's why, that's why that tanha, that craving, that hunger is such a, a powerful teaching in, in Buddhism. It's not an accident that it's like, you know, right there in the, in the middle of the Dhamma. It's not a mistake. Between the thirst and the ignorance supporting each other, you have the asava, the, the floods, the intoxicants that keep this whole thing cycling, pushing, confusing. And as you'll see, I'll be emphasizing, can be clipped, can be interrupted by practice. So I'm painting this in a way that's, I hope, strong. Because then we'll have a strong motivation. Motivation for understanding, for practice. And as you'll see, for kindness and generosity to others. So it looks like a bit of a mess up there, doesn't it? Um, if this were the only mess, it'd be a relative piece of cake. 
Now I can't, I can't cut and paste on my whiteboard. What I would like to do though, is take this whole thing, cut it, and let's just paste it over here. I don't even know if you can see this part of the board. All right, let's get it looking realistic. I'll throw some color in there. And some arrows so you think I actually did something. Yeah, the green. Okay, and we go more arrows, and it's really looking complicated. Well, what do we have? Oh my God, it's another person. In real time, it's another person. It's not the idea of another person right now, it's just scribbles on the board, but we have to touch the intense fact that this whole thing is going on with mom. The whole thing is going on with our colleague at work, with our beloved, our spouse, our partner. The whole thing is going on with that guy over there we don't even know. Now, this is gonna get way too complicated, so I'm not gonna let that happen but I want to just point out a few things because it's really interesting and I hope humbling and uh, inspiring ultimately. So just as in this other individual, here we have more details. So I'm going to use this as a, as a pointer. So now consciousness is arising in each moment and it arises dependent upon contact, pasa, the external base, which right now is other, the internal base, which is most easily referred to as self, but that's just a common convention of language, and consciousness, external base, internal base, consciousness is the basis for contact. Okay? But each moment, this contact is arising based upon mom and mom's contact is arising dependent upon me so already we have uh what i would call a amplifying dynamic of the momentum of these processes. One of the reasons I specifically wanted to point out the Sankara, the constructing processes, and the feedback loops with all of the clinging, the thirsting, the hungering, the becoming, and you know the whole embodiment of that, this is all real now, I'm being born into this now, is because that shows you that each instant of contact is contributing to the narrative, to the story, to the Sankaras. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm looking at you. I'm going to get over here because you guys all know me. I'm looking at you and you have stories about me. Here I am. Make them up. Go ahead. Well, bigger challenge. Try not to make them up. For a moment, you might touch just seeing or something. But then comes the rush of a habit mind. No problem. So now there's this loop. Your story constantly being shifted, maybe just a little, because I'm actually providing input that is fresh, um, fresh formations for you new berries for the cobbler, and here we are. But it's still kind of the same cobbler, you know. It's got a couple of blueberries now. It used to be all raspberries. Although I'm actually adding more raspberries now, so it's not very interesting. But anyway, with, you know, uh, any moment of interpersonal contact, 
that's what we're doing. So we're not only having this blunt interpersonal interaction. We're actually recrafting the story and we're recrafting the dream with each other every instant. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is really important. We're recrafting the dream every moment. Barely. And if we're lucky, because <laughs> usually what we're doing is just living the dream completely out of the fabricated archive. And now it's, you know, me and mom, yeah, it's always like that. Oh, when I see mom, this is how I am, this is how I feel. I don't know, it just seems to be that way. I'm not gonna, not gonna fight it, I'm not gonna worry about it. In comes the delusion, the ignorance builds up, the continuity of becoming, you know, goes on, and mom is part of our, our dream, as opposed to part of our waking up. We'll get to that later. All right, so we're complicit in our ignorance. So if I happen to get really angry with mom and get into this, you know, the uh, kind of the intense formations that come up with anger and the, the whole Nama Rupa experience is one of, um, you know, um, high stress activation then the whole um, body-mind process, of course, the clinging gets stronger, really holding on to my position, my sense of self, all that I fear, all that I want to become, all that I can't become. Oh my God, it's too much. I really, really want to get out, right? So all of that is being amplified. And if mom gets angry at me, then we have a very normal sort of family system of her birthing and my birthing in each moment into that history, whatever's behind that moment of anger. And it just gets stronger and stronger. The dream now, we have no sense that this is being fabricated each moment. We have no sense that we can input into this. We are totally absorbed. The strength of the avijja, the strength of the ignorance at such a moment is complete. And it's held complete by the stresses of becoming, of wanting, of fear. And we can say at, at a grosser level, it's held in place by all these psychodynamics of family systems and so on. That's really secondary. When we're talking about suffering and the end of suffering, we're talking about this cycle. We're not talking about, well, maybe I could learn to love my mom more, and that's the, you know, that's the only cycle that I'm paying attention to. It's the basic becoming into the whole thing that when the Buddha talks about suffering, dukkha, it's the whole thing. It's not some little piece of it. The pieces contribute to the constipation of the system or in the cessation mode the letting go, the shedding, the accumulating, the disentangling. It's the whole thing. This is dukkha, right? So the interpersonal manifesting of dukkha, we, you know, we went to just mom, and why don't we just make it a little more complex and let's throw in, uh, you know, my brother or my sister. And let's get put us all in the same room. No, don't do that. And really what you're talking about in such a moment is, you know, I mean, how many arrows do you want to draw, really? We get the point, don't we? There is, however, uh, some other points that come up that are really, I think, valuable when we consider working as a group and looking at the whole social system and anything like uh, systemic injustice, uh, you know, uh, our own internal racial profiling and the receiving of that profiling by others and so on. And that is... 
I'm just going to leave this up as a reference, but really what we're talking about is not just this, not just one, not just two, not just three, but let's just say many, okay? How can we understand the dynamics of many, of culture, of society, from the standpoint of the most subtle, profound, intrapersonal process of making the story, making the dream, becoming, and suffering. So let's just expand out quickly and see that in any given moment, our, our, if you will, starting point is that in an instant of avijja, it's important because without ignorance, this isn't going to happen. There's the knowing of it and it's cut right here. I wish I could make that even bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. It's cut, but for us, it usually isn't. Humbly, I can say that for myself. So the constructing process that is fostered, enabled, uh, that we have the conditions for in avijja, in ignorance, that constructing process includes in all of these prior moments of contact, prior moments of being in the world, if you will, every social contact, every social notion has registered in some form in the thought stream, in the body-mind stream, okay? And it's out of, e out of that, of course, that consciousness arises and conditions how the world is seen and how the dream is made. But the, this uh, constructing uh, patterns, patterns, processes, uh, is, I don't know what to say other than my experience of it, as close as I get, is that it's subtle beyond belief. It's, it's unnameably subtle in its being multifaceted and um, therefore multifaceted in in the tendencies, the emotional tendencies, and the, the view, the memories, and so on. And therefore multifaceted in its impact. So if you recall, when we spoke about relationship just with one other person, you know, we have consciousness arising each moment, depending upon all of those prior contacts, especially right now relational contacts is relevant. And at the same time, contact is arising with each moment, with our feeling and perception, and so on, of the world. So contact, consciousness, vinyana, consciousness, consciousness is arising dependent upon this whole cloud of my becoming, my basis for becoming, and it's arising dependent upon the world as such. And so my moment of relationship with you is really you are like the, the needle that points into the haystack of Sankara and says, out comes this thread, out comes this piece of hay, which then of course connects to lots of other hay. So the, the world is being formed both from the contact with you and my inner universe of history and so on. And it's like this. But now, instead of just thinking about, instead of just speaking about with one, 
that's true for the totality of society and culture. So every time I see you, I'm not just seeing you, I'm seeing you in the context of a whole system. I can't help it. I don't just see Lucy, I see woman and all women. I don't just see Dow, I see, let's say, a man, but I also see, let's say, something like friend and all friends. And if I'm within a smaller system of, let's say, a work environment, you know, I don't want to say work, it makes it sound so monetary, but let's say uh, 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 an environment where we're moving together to do something. Let's say I see uh, Phyllis and uh, I see, first of all, there's just the, you know, the direct perception, feeling and perception and so on. But then there's the Sankaras the, the, to help me know not only in the perceptual process that not only knows woman, but the Sankaras that know something of my emotional history or intellectual history, uh, experiential history with Phyllis. And so I'm seeing her through that. Now, that might be happening, probably is happening, without my knowing it. So I'm going to keep bringing you back to this avijja, this ignorance, because it doesn't have to be this way. But we need to understand the nature of dukkha so we can understand the ending of dukkha, right? But when it comes to culture, to, to, to the big issues like race, injustice, economic injustice, and it comes to your sense, my sense of who am I in this culture. We have, if I'm dramatic, seven billion, but you know, whatever you consider to be your circle, well, you know, it depends on how big you want to go. Um, we could go to the whole country, we could go to the whole world. We have in each individual the intrapersonal process of world formation and becoming based in most of us, in most of them and us, but based on ignorance. So there's this, all these momentums, all these different loops we're talking about, so it's all real. And within that, each of these individuals has some notion of woman, of man, of friend, of coworker, of teacher, of uh, you know, all of the outer fabrications, because now what these, all these individual creatures are gonna do is they're, I need another color. They're going to cluster together, aren't they? Isn't that what we do? We work in smaller units. Maybe there's a family unit, but maybe there's a corporation. Oh, look, right there. It's Google. You know, over here, hey, it's General Electric or SAS, you know, whatever. Um, but then we have, of course, notions of clustering of the United States of America, of Argentina, of you know whatever germany and so on all of those clusters are not separate at all from the clusters of formed by perceptual processes and registered as part of the sankara archive of skin color ethnicity religion, even if there's no physical difference in the being, we've constructed them as Sunni or Shia or whatever, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, and so on. So we've got endless categories because if I could quickly draw a picture of a brain, that's what I would do. The brain does that. That's, I think, one of the easiest materialistic ways to understand it. That's what the brain is made to do. It's made to understand and control the world so that the organism can get safe, get fed, get sex, procreate, exist, cluster into groups for safety. I mean, this is how we evolved to survive. And the mechanism of constructing categories is intrinsic to that. There's no way out. But keep coming back, I hope you accept this. In the 
knowing of the process, something can change. So I want to talk for a moment about the uh, clipping, is how I'm thinking of it right now, the clipping of any of these threads, the way I've emphasized the clipping of ignorance, and then that will prepare the ground for our next talk. Um, the clipping is uh, you might say a injection through whatever conditions and means, and that's gonna be the basis of what we'll talk about later. Because now we're talking about how do I live? How do I practice? What do I do given the human predicament, given my human predicament, and given my understanding this, my heart vibrates for everybody in the world. What can I do? Okay, so just to get a notion that I've, I keep emphasizing this because it's sort of blunt and obvious. When you wake up to this process, already the momentum is interrupted. Can that interruption be sustained? And can there be the collapse of the ignorance-based system that leads so surely to suffering? And when we talk about, for example, the mind was liberated from the taints, from the floods, from the intoxicants, liberated by non-clinging. So you clip the clinging that comes up out of thirst that leads to becoming, that leads to identity, that is the clustered center, the locus of all of this in the becoming, in the bhava, I am and then I have to be protected. I am thirsty, I am stressed, I am white, I am angry, I am a dad, a mom, right? So liberated from the floods of becoming, from the floods of ignorance by non-clinging. So we're talking about cutting, cutting perhaps right there between before the becoming or Right out of thirst is really much safer. You're actually cutting the clinging because there's mindfulness, in a word, that knows this is where the mind needs to be established, where the foundation of mind needs to be, to strip the dream of its power source. So we're gonna come back to that in a minute. But before we do, uh, I wanna to touch another, um, well, I don't know if it's gonna work with all that bright sunlight. Can you read the green text at all? Can you see it or is it too bright? Give me a thumbs up, thumbs down. Thumbs down, damn. Uh, there's not a lot I can do about it without going on the roof. So I'm not going to do that. Okay, I'll have to read it to you. Sorry. Um, there's a teaching the Buddha offered um, that uh, uh, Venerable Bodhi, Bhikkhu Bodhi, refers to as transcendental, dependent origination. Uh, and he's referring to the transcending the cycle of suffering. Okay? And... Uh, it's a teaching that if any of you who have done retreat, which is with me, which is all of you, uh, I've actually taught many times, but it's always in disguise. So I'm going to, um, uh, I'm going to uh, right now uh, blow, my, blow my cover. Um, and that is that the moment of suffering in one beautiful discourse the Buddha talks about leads to derangement or search, to insanity or looking further. You have no choice. That's just when the suffering is that bad is the easiest way to understand it, right? But in some sense, not in some sense, in a very real sense, it's always true. 
do I stay in the cycle of suffering or do I, do I look to understand and get outside the cycle? And uh, so does anybody have, this is from the discourses, does anybody have a word or two that will help end my suffering? And so there's a turning towards some source, whatever that might be for you, of understanding. And that turning is a kind of a it's sada, it's a kind of a confidence or a faith that something might be found. So that's now the next link. We go around the cycle, we go through the birthing, it's like this, it's really like this, this is really terrible, suffering, aging, illness, death, everything, all that stuff, sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, despair, distress, sadness, terror, whatever. Only now the next step is a turning in confidence, faith. There's, there's, there's got to be another way. And from faith, so it's to still, depending upon suffering, arises sada, faith, confidence. Then depending upon that confidence, that faith, arises a kind of a joy. Oh my God, there is a possibility here. And then depending upon the joy arises actually when practice ripens. Let's, uh, I've left out stages that are from another discourse of turning towards, let's say, a, a source like a teacher and giving ear and having reflective acceptance of those, you know, taking the teachings in, hearing them, memorizing, coming to reflective acceptance of the teachings. I'm skipping all of that because it's not part of the traditional transcendent dependent origination, but it does tie it into what we're doing here and what you do anytime you turn to a source of wisdom, another person or, uh, you know, formal like the Dhamma. And then depending upon the arising of that joy, there's actually uh, an opening to piti, to uh, a rapture, to... Uh, a quality of body, mind, uh, joy, and pleasure that is opening doors and turning you in another direction. That's the important part, is it turns the mind. And then depending upon that arises tranquility. The body, mind becomes more at peace. There is another alternative. And in fact, if the rapture is significantly developed, say in formal practice, the tranquility, likewise, becomes highly developed. And depending upon the arising of tranquility, there will be happiness, sukha. Uh, a, a body mind that even the, even the a brilliance of the mind is not overwhelming. There's a kind of a happiness because you have a, this, this uh, calming of this terrible cycle. It's beginning to really become muted, sufficiently interrupted, and those clips that we talked about a moment ago are naturally happening. There's a, like a dissolving as if you've got some sort of, if you don't mind, some sort of cancer drug that's dissolving the cell. The cell is beginning to dissolve. And then depending upon that happiness and the calming that comes, Concentration. Stillness of the mind. And the mind is still bright. And knowing experience and not jumping around because it's content right where it is. Samadhi. And we're seeing through the samadhi, we begin to see into the process. And the next uh, link in this transcendent dependent origination is knowing and seeing things as they actually are. Perhaps you're beginning to recognize this as what I offer in retreat while you're lying down. I don't know if you remember that. I hope you do, if you've been to many retreats especially. 
knowing and seeing things as they actually are. That's the work of concentration. Because the mind is still enough to see into the nature. Avija, non-ignorance. The cycle is really getting broken here, friends. And dependent upon the knowledge and vision of things as they actually are, there's a disenchantment. What is disenchantment? It's the breaking of that dream that we've been talking about. Nibida, the breaking of the dream, the enchantment, the trance, in which this whole process is unfolding and becoming apparently real. It's a cloud, a mirage, a perception, a cluster of foam. We don't have to think about that. This is known. This is not an intellectual process, you see? And then depending upon that disenchantment, what happens? All of the passion that drives it, all of my anger, all of my wants, all of my needs, all of my sense of being uh, abused, all of my uh, um, uh, uh, self-serving, self-centered notions of the world are, uh, the passion is, is gone from them because there's this clarity. That doesn't mean one doesn't see when one's eyes are open the world's injustices, but the ability to act is not coming from a self-centered, ignorant heart completely different source of action. And then dependent upon that dispassion, well, emancipation, knowledge and vision of, you know, things as they are. And then the final knowledge and vision of the destruction of these floods, of these taints, the basic collapse of ignorance, the drivenness of sensuality, all senses, and the drivenness of becoming, of I am, gone. So that's the transcendent dependent origination. And what's important for us to leave us, that I want to leave us with, is that The, the process of movement through this life, even with all of its momentum that all of us feel towards dukkha, towards suffering and confusion, there's that choice, that flip in each moment of suffering to incline towards this exquisite and beautiful possibility also a real lived human possibility. And so the qualities lead to dispassion, not to passion. I think we covered that, right? To being unfettered, not fettered, to shedding, not accumulating, you could see it all fits. To modesty, not self-aggrandizement, to contentment, not discontent, to being disentangled, or shall I say, to seclusion, not to entanglement, seclusion from the insanity, to being to aroused persistence, not laziness, I certainly hope, and to being unburdensome, not to being burdensome. So may that, may that serve. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll go further in our next talk. Throughout our, uh, throughout our investigation of dependent origination, we've been reminding ourselves of our purpose, um, really not wanting this to be some intellectual exercise, some abstract Dhamma talk, but what's, you know, what's really going to move the heart. In Buddhist language, what's going to shift our view 
towards right view, samaditi, what's going to really be part of the path uh, out of the dream into a kind of a way of being that is intrinsically uh, skillful and wise. And because the self-obsession has dissolved along with the ignorance is also intrinsically loving and compassionate and joyful. Um, and our orienting is, you know, we continue to come back to, um, as for those qualities of which we know, uh, they lead to dispassion, not to passion, to being unfettered, not to being fettered, to shedding, not to accumulating, to modesty, not to self-aggrandizement, to contentment, not to discontent, to seclusion, not to entanglement, to aroused persistence, not to laziness, to being burdensome, unburdensome, not to being burdensome. And the Buddha says, you may categorically hold this is the Dhamma, this is the Vinaya, this is the teacher's instruction. And so we're talking about now practices. We're talking about a path. And my hope is that as we explore in this next little while, that you are really asking, what is the path for me? What really makes sense? What can I actually do? Or what conditions can I establish in my life that incline in this wholesome direction? Because I can begin to get a sense, if I don't, the momentum of this process that's going on in body, mind, and then between us, and then in society at large, and that sustains and has this kind of a, a momentum. It's just, that is the stream. And when we talk about the Buddha's teachings as going against the stream, that's the stream it's going against, okay? So I wanna begin by uh, referencing what I hope will be a, a bridging of the dependent origination teachings we've been looking at and formal practices and then in your life in any given moment practice okay that's where, where i want to start so since you've you know got a pretty good basis uh in remembering that we're starting with the ignorance the avijja uh what are we talking about when that we talk about practice? Well, from the standpoint of uh, uh, formal Buddha Dhamma, Sati Sampajanya. Sati is the, what is translated often as mindfulness or recollective awareness, remembering and keeping in mind that foundation, whatever your foundation of mindfulness is just then. And Sampajanya is the kind of the perspective or the clear knowing that comes with that, that informs the sati. Sati sampajanya as a, as a uh, construct, a larger construct. So in the moment that there's the knowing and the sampajanya is the knowing of this dhamma, it's the uh, recollection and the sati is sustaining that recollection. The mindfulness is, is, is the sustaining. And we just, you know, in formal practice, we do in a very refined way eventually over the course of, let's say, lots of years or lots of retreat or whatever, that can get very refined in terms of seeing how the avijja is coming up and how it can be broken by the knowing and so on. But in everyday life as well, do I remember? Sati, remembering. Do I remember? Cut the avijja, right there, cut the ignorance. When the remembering has the sampajanya, has samaditi, has perspective, has right view, understanding, you understand. What we're doing here is you and I, right now, practicing right view. This is the Eightfold Path we're engaged in. So, beginning with the 
ignorance. There you go. In terms of inside dialogue, it's really simple. Pause. Cut. 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 We pause together. And now the power of relationship is not tying tighter the fetters, but we're unfettering together. Ah, together we cut. Ah. Pause, cut, pause, cut, together. Remembering, sati. And the energy, the virya, the right effort, eightfold path, the right effort comes up and is sustained between us. And in an organization, let's say, something like Meta Program, Sankhya Institute, that's our commitment, cut just as a kind of remembering, but we need to build the story, the Sankaras, we need to build the story where consciousness arises out of a story that says cutting is important. So we, you know, we need to re-steer the Titanic, don't we? Cut, Avija. Avija Pachaya Sankara. Out of this ignorance arises these formations. What's the practice built around Sankara? Do you know your story? Do you look at your story? Can I reveal your story to you by being a white male? You bet I can. Go ahead, react to me all you want, but just get something out of it. You can dislike me, you can hate me, you can think I'm imperious. You can think I have too much built-in privilege. But watch your story. Cut. Cut the sankara. Don't let it feed the dream. And when it feeds the dream, wake up to it. Sankara pachaya vinyana. Depending upon that whole momentum, that whole storyline, upon your views, and the reinforcing of those views and the sustaining of those views arises consciousness. And it's, you know, the knowing of the world. Now it's seeing the world through the whole lens of the Sankaras, of these construction processes. Can you observe in your formal practice, in your silent practice? Can you sense into, you won't get all the details, never. The Buddha said, forget it. You'll never get to the beginning of it. Don't try. But right there, right at the tip of the moment, Sankara Pachaya Vinyana. Can you know Sankara? Can you know the arising of consciousness? Can that, where is this cognizing? I mean, what is this experience of cognizing the world? And wow, it's already conditioned by my ignorance. Cut, cut right there. Sankara, Pachaya Vinyana, Pachaya Nama Rupa. So what is known is body mind, the psychophysical totality. This was a central teaching for one of my teachers, Ajahn Soban. Nama Rupa. What is the relationship between Nama Rupa? Are you actually remembering sati to investigate nama rupa. Can you do that formally in your practice? When you practice, let's say, vipassana meditation, and you get to see more and more as the sati and the samadhi, the mindfulness and concentration strengthen, can you see how the uh, form known by the senses and the sensing, which seemed at times so disparate are a complex arising here and now and cut through that seed from which the world is built, the body-mind. Pachaya Salayatana. So this bifurcation or this multifurcation into all of the specific senses 
Can you touch each sense? Can, can you sati, remember? With your dhamma your investigation of phenomena, can you investigate? Seeing, and, and I'm going to go right to pasa, seeing contact or hearing, you stay ensconced in identification, in avijja, in ignorance, in the story, or is there just seeing? You know that famous teaching to Bahia, in the seeing there's just the seen, in the hearing there's just the heard, this is where it lives. This is it. And people want to make that almost a trivially easy teaching because it's so beautiful and easy to say, you know, it's not too many words, but look at what you're dealing with here. The avijja pachaya sankara pachaya vinyana, vinyana, consciousness is arising like this whole story is already made, and it's not in the seeing, there's only the seeing. In the seeing, there's the dream. Vinyana, nama, rupa, the cycle of the dream. In seeing, there's only the seeing. In hearing, there's only the heard. Cognizing is only the cognized. But it's a practice. It's a formal practice. You can go very deep, but you can also bring it to your life. Try it with a person. Oh my God. And do you think you can do it with your social conditioning? Do you think you can see society just as the seen and the heard? without all your reactions and your stories, oh, my heart breaks. My heart just breaks how imprisoned we are by that. And with contact, there arises feeling. Always. Poof. Contact. Feeling. Vedana. Vedana Nupasana. That's the Vipassana meditation based on the foundation of Vedana, feeling. Pleasant, unpleasant, neither pleasant nor unpleasant. Is it worldly? Is it unworldly? The arising of it, the cessation of it. That's a practice. It's a real practice. It's a formal practice, but you can bring it into your life. Vedana. I'll tell you, with illness, strong illness and strong discomfort, you want to have a basis of practicing with Vedana. I'll tell you right now. Do your work now while well, you still have time. You understand what I'm saying? And the Vedana arising with contact with another person or multiple people, can you do the work right there? Vedana. Vedana Nupasana, whether it's some sitting in a hall with a bunch of other people, most of them white. Meditating with Vedana Nupasana, that's great. Sitting in an office with three other people or in a Skype or Zoom or other teleconference setting with multiple people, Vedana Nupasana. Pleasant, unpleasant, neither pleasant nor unpleasant. Almost all of it is going to be worldly, pleasant or unpleasant. The unworldly comes up out of usually stronger meditation. Meaning, you know, all this rapture and joy and all that stuff. And we could go from the feeling, of course, directly to the tanha, the hunger, the thirst. Now, Many of you have done contemplations with Tanha, with retreat, at retreats with me and with others. Maybe you've studied it as well. But is it a practice? Do you understand that Tanha arises based on the conditions of feeling? Feeling that's rooted in ignorance. Cut the ignorance. Cut the contact that is based on ignorance, cut the feeling based on ignorance, and you cut the engine of craving. In that moment, maybe you haven't seen through the whole system, maybe it's not all collapsing yet, sorry. 
it will. And of course, out of the clinging, that energy, the energy of clinging arises on the uh, electrical power of the tanha, of the thirst, applying itself across the, across the battery poles, the electrical poles of this life to create the gripping of the robot arm onto phenomena. It's like this. And the dream gets stronger, the dream gets real, and out of that clinging, pachaya, bhavo, bhava, I am. Now these are practices. You can do these practices in a formal, individual practice, and as you know, you can powerfully investigate together what is this tanha? What is this vedana? What is this gripping? What is the nature of it? How does it lead to this becoming? What is my experience now? Am I? Am I am? It's practice. Can you do this in the office? Can you do this in your family? Well, the power of the sankaras, the momentum, all the action that I have to take, I have to get the, you know, the peas and bananas on the table. Not easy. No one said it was. It's a gradual path. It's a gradual path, but you can cut it. You can cut it anywhere. You can cut it. Right effort, diligence, persistence, patience, resolve. Or suffer continually, <laughs> endlessly, birth after birth after birth. And you know, just to to finish, you know, the clinging, the becoming, the birth, the enfleshment of it. Birth, I am. Can you look at your enfleshment moment by moment? Can you do this in, let's say, vipassana, formal practice, either in the kaya nupassana, the awareness of the body, or the forming of the whole through the dhamma nupassana, the phenomenal experience, through the lens of birth and suffering. Of course, we know suffering is a practice, don't we? I'm not going to even go into it. You guys know it so well. Dukkha. cut. Where can you cut? So this points to the path. These are practices. But what is the nature? So what is the nature of the constant reforming of greed, hatred, and delusion? Take greed, hatred, and delusion as your practice. Am I grabbing and holding and wanting the world in my, in the self-obsession that comes out of bhava, out of becoming? What do you think greed has its basis in? In becoming. If there's no you in the center, why would you hold on to anything? So what's the result of non-greed? Generosity. Everything flows through you. Generosity is not some sort of clip-on, like a, you know, like a clip-on tie. Generosity is the outflow and the practice of leading to the outflow of the world moving through you. It's an intimacy with the world that is so not separated in self that there's nothing to impede the flow of giving, of dana. So greed, hatred, and delusion can be your basis. Or your practice could just be the chaga, the generosity. Or perhaps we could ask about this formal structure of the, the uh, factors of awakening, you know, which one explores, we've explored many times in detail, but when you develop the mindfulness, the investigation, the energy, 
you know, and so on, all the way through to the concentration and equanimity. You're practicing to refine the mind, to prepare the conditions for the cutting anywhere when you have enough power in the factors of awakening, the Bojanga. It's really strong stuff. It's like sulfuric acid to the, you know, to the infrastructure of becoming. The cell dissolves. What about the spiritual faculties? You know, it's just another construct that can help us, that can give us a doorway into how do I actually do this? What's going on? How do I assess where I am? Where do I put my focus? Mindfulness needs to be cultivated, but we begin with sada, confidence, faith. We balance that with wisdom. Sometimes we're just confident. We don't really understand so well. Sometimes we really get it. Energy being balanced with concentration. Sometimes there's the fire. Sometimes there's the stilling. And then the mindfulness that helps steer. These are the spiritual faculties. It's another way of saying, okay, I'll practice with that. If I practice with that, will that support the arising of shedding, not accumulating of modesty, not self-aggrandizement? Well, you have a way through Paticca Samapada of understanding how that happens. When you, you know, know that you can cut anywhere, the spiritual faculties, you understand how is that gonna help me cut? How is seeing greed, hatred, and delusion, and so on gonna help me cut? Then you see, yes, these practices lead towards what we've identified as wholesome, as liberating. But the queen, the king, the emperor of, the, of paths is just the Eightfold Path, the noble Eightfold Path. Why is it noble? Because it gets the whole thing. It's got the overview. It's noble. It's ennobling. It sees the whole thing, this path. That's why you start in the Eightfold Path with Samaditi, right view, you understand, and that's what we're doing here. Let's understand. And when there's the experiential right view, not the conceptual, but the true Diti, the true shift of perspective, then that shift of perspective creates changing of the direction of the heart. I don't want to stay entranced. I don't want to stay enfleshed in my suffering. And I don't want to create so much suffering for you. I'm so sorry. I feel shame and remorse, hiri and otapa. I can practice with the hiri and the otapa with the sense of, oh God, it, I really blew it and it really hurts. I don't want to do that again. Looking to the past and knowing the hurt, the harm you've caused, looking to the future and not wanting to do it again. This is a practice too, but you see this humbly. You see this and you're motivated. So the Eightfold Path is, you know, covering and this shift of intention says, what's the direction of the path? I have experience of the beauty. I have experience of the liberative process in, in as far as I have that experience, I trust that experience. That's important. Gives you the energy to move forward, the confidence, the sada to move forward. And the right action, right speech, right living, right livelihood. These are the, these are the bread and butter, the flesh and blood of the path. If you don't see it in action, if you don't see it and hear it in speech and livelihood, let there be doubt, not just in yourself, but in others. You should be assessing me, <laughs> you know, and everybody else, not, not with cruelty, but just to know that it's all one path, not to look for perfection, good Lord, 
but just to say, yeah, okay, so this being also functions sometimes from ignorance. I feel compassion for that. But I'm not going to follow the ignorance. A good friendship, a kalyanamita, will work with you. And as a, as a community of kalyanamita, we form and orient towards the Eightfold Path. Our good friendships help us remain with right speech and right action. It's not easy. And same with the right effort, mindfulness, and concentration. And if we understand something of the... Uh, if we understand something of the um, challenge of this trance, of this dream, maybe we can begin to understand something of why a practice, a formal practice is important. In Insight Dialogue, why does it matter that we develop these meditative qualities of mind? Well, maybe you understand now the speed, the automatic nature, the constant reinforcing of the trance internally in these loops and between us means that without the mindfulness, without the investigation, energy, and concentration, we won't be able to catch it. It's like we're, we're, we're doing a race against Speedy Gonzalez or the Flash or something. We don't even see the guy. He's so fast. And that's, that's the me formation. And how do we stay on track? We've got the wisdom element. This is just pointing. Everything I'm saying is not true. Everything I'm saying is constructed. The Dhamma is constructed. But it is such a brilliant construction with, in my experience, such veridicality, such conformity to how things actually are. So I stay on track. Even when I begin to get confused, I have a reference point that is outside the system of my trance. Do you understand that? The Dhamma sits outside the system of your personal trance. This is really important. It stands outside the system of the social cultural trance. This is really important. And on the relational piece, you know, we know, we've seen, the power of relationship to reinforce, accelerate, amplify, strengthen the unwholesome. It's exactly that power that we're invoking in relational practice, that same power moving towards strengthening the meditative element, strengthening the focus on the wisdom element and revealing the wisdom element in real time. And we need it, don't we? Don't we need it? Don't we need that cutting quality? And we can't do it all alone. We just can't. So we enter the challenge and we enter the opportunity of doing it together. Spiritual friendship is the entirety of the holy life. It's not an empty saying. It often gets passed along like, okay, let's be buddies. Let's be Dhamma buddies. And it's kind of, you know, I'll share my green tea with you. This is a, this is a, a, a powerful, powerful teaching on the, uh, the raw energy that comes with interpersonal contact and social contact and the aiming it towards the good, kalyanamita, the spiritual friendship, the friendship towards liberation, whether it's an organizational structure, a family structure, and bless our dear, sweet, hurting hearts, a social structure, I don't know, you know, I'm not a utopian. We do the best we can. But this is our work. Clip, clip, clip. Clip, contact, feeling, craving, clinging, becoming, sankaras, clip, 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 clip. Ah, relaxing. Touching the awareness. The awareness doesn't participate in the clipping or the forming. 
it just gets confused, it gets clouded. The mind is essentially luminous. So we recognize the clouds, the cloud making machine. We begin to deprive it of its fuel. We live wisely. What's the, what's, what does love look like in this cycle? How do we reinforce that love? and shift the sankharas towards kindness and compassion. What's the natural flow of compassion when the self is not in the way? How do I live to invite that possibility, to invoke what is already latent in this human potential? So I'll close just by reminding us again, thanks for your patience. As for those qualities of which you may know, and please consider everything we've been touching, the practices we've been touching, everything, your potential, our potential, the human potential. These qualities lead to dispassion, not to passion, to being unfettered, not to being fettered, to shedding, not to accumulating, to modesty, not self-aggrandizement. to contentment, not to discontent, to seclusion, not to entanglement, to persistence, not to laziness. To being unburdensome, not to being burdensome. You may categorically hold, this is the Dhamma. This is the Vinaya. This is the teacher's instruction. So thank you, friends. May everything that we've done together, all of our time together, serve for the freeing of our hearts, the awakening of the heart. And may this also touch in this moment and all future moments, the liberation of all beings who similarly suffer in the trance. May they all be free from suffering. May all beings be at peace. May there be peace. May there be peace. May there be peace. Thanks. <laughs>